Hey guys, Will here, welcome back to the channel. Now today I wanted to tackle a very frequently asked question in the comments on my videos, which is, do I need to spend a lot of money on an expensive motherboard to get the best overclocks out of my system? So, to really answer this question properly, we need to we need to look at a couple of things. First of all, we need to look at the reasons why people overclock in the first place. So, to understand this is really to understand the answer to the question because it's gonna vary depending on what kind of person you are and what you're actually trying to achieve. So. To explain that a little bit further, if you're the sort of person that is just wanting to get the most out of your system, get the most out of your CPU without going crazy and without really competing and just wanting to have the best possible sort of day-to-day -day performance, you probably don't need to go and spend a whole bunch of crazy money on your motherboard. But if you're the sort of person that really wants to compete and you know see those crazy high numbers in Cinebench and stuff like that, really wants to be at that elite point where you can really tweak and modify everything and is not satisfied with anything less than that, then you probably do want to spend a little bit more money on a motherboard that's going to allow you to do all those sorts of things. So to elaborate on that a little bit further, if we travel back in time 20 years back to 1998 when I first started overclocking, back then we didn't have motherboards that were specifically designed and marketed for the purposes of overclocking. So back then you had a couple of dip switches that you could use to adjust the multiplier if you were lucky enough to have an unlocked CPU and you could also adjust your front side bus speed you know, plus or minus maybe 50, 100 megahertz, if, if, if that. So you're really limited in what you could do. But that was kind of part of the fun back then was that because, because stuff wasn't actually designed for doing it, you kind of had to know what you were doing. You kind of had to do a lot of trial and error. And because the, the actual returns that you would get out of it were quite small by today's standards, it was quite exciting to sort of see just how far you could push things. But fast forward back to today, and we've got a plethora of hardware which is actually designed for the purpose of overclocking. So higher quality VRMs, you know, better quality, better settings that you have inside the BIOS to actually give you more control over exactly what you can adjust. And I mean, these days we can adjust literally everything. There's stuff in there that you, that, you know, 99.9% .9 of people are never going to touch. But the fact that it's there is kind of cool because it means that if you do really get into it, you can start tweaking and you can squeeze a lot more performance out of things. But the point I'm trying to make here is the whole point of overclocking at a fundamental point is to squeeze the most out of the hardware that you already have. And you know, if you then go and spend a couple of hundred dollars more on a more expensive motherboard that allows you to overclock more, would you not then have been better off just buying a faster CPU or faster RAM to begin with? So it kind of becomes this enthusiast thing where it's like, are you are you trying to squeeze the most performance out of the hardware that you already have? Is that the reason why you're doing it? Or are you just wanting to see the highest numbers possible out of your benchmarks and so forth? And you know, that's sort of, over the last 20 years of doing this, I've become an enthusiast and I've become the sort of person that wants to buy the high quality hardware so I can really push the envelope and really compete with those elite overclockers that are getting the crazy high numbers in, you know, the various overclocking and various benchmarking software. So if you're the sort of person that really wants to get into it as a hobby, then yeah, absolutely, it is worth purchasing a little bit more of expensive motherboard that does give you those high quality VRMs. And the reason for that is, High quality componentry and more settings allow you more adjustability. The high quality components give you a lot more stability in terms of voltage and current load and stuff like that. They're, they supply the CPU with much cleaner power essentially. And we're not going to go into all the heavy tech in this video because it's not really the point in this video. But yes, you are going to get more stable overclocks and higher overclocks out of a system that has a high quality motherboard. It's simple physics really. The more stable the power supply is, the more, you know, the, the high quality all those sort of components are, the better overclocks you're going to get. There's no question about it. But Really what it comes down to is the point of diminishing returns. So say for example, my CPU, my 8086 that I have in my system here, I can run that at 5.1 gigahertz at relatively low voltage, no AVX offset, day in, day out, no problem. The temperatures are well within their tolerances and you know I can run that comfortably without a problem day in, day out. Now if I push that to 5.2 gigahertz, starting to push a little bit higher on the voltage. We're also having to start to push the motherboard a little bit harder in how it, how it actually controls the power and stuff like that. And therefore the temperatures start to come up. 5.3 gigahertz, I'm really having to start pushing things. The temperatures are coming up more. I'm driving the motherboard harder and I'm really starting to take advantage of those enhanced settings and those you know better quality components that are on my motherboard. But in saying that, the actual real world performance difference between 5.1 gigahertz and 5.3 gigahertz is absolutely minuscule. You don't notice it in day-to-day -day computing. So say for example, I did a test the other day where I rendered a video that took 10 minutes to render. 5.1 gigahertz, it took exactly 10 minutes and 15 seconds. And then when I overclocked to 5.3 gigahertz, it took 10 minutes exactly. So 
you know, over the course of 10 minutes, it was 15 seconds difference. And that's not really, to me, as a daily, as a daily driver, that's not worth spending a couple of hundred dollars extra on your motherboard just to get such a small little bit of performance increase. Now, the other thing that we need to consider here is that a lot of these motherboards that are marketed as overclocking motherboards, they really are beyond the needs of the average person. So even for me, like, I mean, I, I'm running a, I'm running a custom loop in my system. I'm running pretty high end hardware. And even I'm not pushing anywhere near the limits of my motherboard. Not until it's not until you start getting into phase change cooling, exotic cooling, and you know liquid nitrogen, that sort of thing, that you really start to take advantage of all the features that these motherboards have. So just because you spent a lot more money on a high-end overclocking motherboard doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually going to get any more performance out of it at all. And I mean, to give you a usage case scenario for me, I had my 8700K in my Maximus X motherboard. And then I went and swapped it into a Strix Z370 motherboard, which when I put it into my wife's computer, now I was able to push that CPU a little bit harder in my Maximus X than I was in the Z370 Strix motherboard. But for day-to-day -day running, the clock speed was actually exactly the same. The voltages were the same and everything. But it wasn't until I was actually trying to push those numbers and really get the most out of the benchmarks and compete that I actually saw any advantage at all from the Maximus X. So for day-to-day -day running, it actually made no difference. So if I'd gone and bought a Maximus X just for that purpose, then it would have been a complete waste of money over the Strix Z370. So that's just one example there. But what you really need to understand is that if you're the sort of person that's just going to be using automatic overclock settings, or you're just the, just the sort of person that's going to want to say, all right, what settings should I use to overclock my CPU? Bang, done, never look at it again. Then you're probably not going to get the money out of, you're probably not going to get your money's worth out of a more expensive motherboard. I'll be looking at a sort of a middle of the range. Don't just get the cheapest possible, but look at a sort of middle of the range motherboard that still gives you good quality VRMs, still gives you some overclockability in terms of the settings in the BIOS, but isn't really designed at that high end. It's, it's like buying a Ferrari to drive on the street, you know, unless you're an enthusiast. It's kind of a waste of money. So look, I hope that kind of answers the question. It's it's a bit of a tricky question to answer because the answer is different for different people, but you really need to figure out what your goals are, what you're actually trying to achieve. And from there, you can make some decisions. So look, as always, I'm happy to discuss this further in the comments, reach out on the Discord channel as well, which I will link below. And of course, if you are a patron through Patreon, you have exclusive access to some troubleshooting help there as well. I'm always happy to, happy to do one-on-ones with you to sort of help you overclock a little bit further and things like that. So look, I hope you found the video interesting and useful if you have as always please like and subscribe hit the notification button as well so you don't miss the next video thank you very much for watching and i will see you next time bye